Our second reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 3, verses uh, 12 through 17. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves in compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. God, as we hear your word by the power of your spirit, may we be given the wisdom to understand and the courage to follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I don't get laryngitis all that often, but when I do, it's on Sunday, always. We're going to try to charge through here. I'll do my best. I'm Owen's basketball coach, and he had a game yesterday, and there's nothing more worthless than a coach that can't talk, shouting from the sideline without any sound. So, Anyways, on to the sermon. Uh, Paul has covered a lot of territory in this short letter to the Colossians. He begins with them by establishing... Uh, fruitfulness as what it is, as, as what makes the church distinctive in the context of this all-powerful Roman Empire, that above all it is the church's calling to bear fruit even in this empire. And though the empire appears, though the empire rather re revolves around Caesar, around his power, around his, even his divinity, Paul assures the Colossians that all of creation revolves around Christ, that Christ is the firstborn of creation, the firstborn from the dead, that in him all things hold together, that he will reconcile all things to himself. Paul acknowledges the difficulties that the Colossians face, torn from two directions, on one side by the law and the challenge of accommodating Gentile Christians into what once was the Jewish Faith. And on the other side, the philosophy of the Greek and Roman world. They are pulled in both directions, and he encourages them not to think of Christ as a, a new absolute that can be used as a weapon against these others who disagree with them, but instead that Christ has nailed all of it to the cross. That in Christ, all of this, uh, this weaponizing of our truth is undermined. And instead, he again returns the importance of bearing fruit, that that is the mark of Christian truth. But for early Christians, the law was especially dangerous in this regard, in the same way that today for us, religion can be an idol as much as it is an avenue for us to approach God. And so Paul cautions them against seeing in the Jewish law the real substance when in fact it is that Christ who is the substance and the law is but a shadow. So Paul has been addressing all of these concerns that, that the Colossians are facing from the outside, from the empire, from the Jews who have not gotten on board with this new thing called Christianity. But now Paul turns to the challenges that face the church from the inside, namely how to behave, how to get along. So the internal health of the church for Paul in Scripture generally has two dimensions. One is purity, the purity of the church, and the other is unity, the unity of the church. And in our passage this morning, Paul is addressing that first dimension of purity. And the passage that we look at next week will address that second dimension of the church's unity. Now, usually when we think of purity, we think of a sort of a, a high moral rectitude, a, a sort of very obvious righteousness that is bordering on perfection. That is what purity suggests in our mind, and so we tend to ignore it. Uh, we are Presbyterians. We are a part of the Reformed 
tradition which has always from the beginning emphasized our total depravity, our sinfulness, our sinful nature that no matter how hard we work, how, how well we do, we still are sinful creatures in need of God's redemption. And when you emphasize that so uh, uh, vehemently, it's very hard then to think uh, that purity in terms of moral perfection is even possible. So we tend to ignore purity. We tend not really to, to talk about it. But we need to remember our context, both our context here in the 21st century and the context of the Colossian church in the first century. Of course, Colossians, they, they existed in the context of the Roman Empire. We today exist in the context not of a, of a single empire, but we are surrounded by powers that impact our lives in so many ways that are so difficult even to see. And the real power of an empire, whether it be in the first century or in the 21st century, is not its military might, it's not its political might in the world, it is its ability to immerse its subjects in a, a totalizing worldview. A worldview that prevents us from seeing anything except on the terms of the empire. We view the world precisely the way that the empire wants us to view the world. Our imaginations are held captive. A good analogy of this is, is driving. You're driving a car, you're behind the wheel, you are in control. But you pull out your phone and you have Google Maps telling you, where to go. The empire has given us the maps. We may be driving, we may have the will, but the empire has produced the road maps that are guiding us, the road maps through which we see the world as we navigate our way through it. Paul says, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. We've talked about this before. It sounds as if Paul is counseling the church, to use a modern expression, to be so heavenly minded that there are no earthly good. It seems like Paul is suggesting that this world and everything in it is evil, to be ignored, to be disregarded. Heaven is good. Set your mind on heaven, and one day you will be there and forget earth, its worries, its problems, and the sin of this world. Shadow and substance, it comes to mind as we think about that passage from last week and the temptation to view the substance as this uh, heavenly life that we look forward to that is more real than reality as we know it, and the reality around us is but a shadow. But Paul is not saying this. Paul is urging uh, his church to see the world around them as their calling, not as something they are to be escaping from. Which gets us back to what we typically think of when we think of purity. Purity, we often think of as a, a way of setting ourselves apart from the, the filth of the world, preventing ourselves from being stained by the world. We maintain our moral purity, and in order to do that, we keep ourselves separate. This is a notion of purity that Christians have inherited from the Jewish tradition, which had, a very, had very strict rules about ritual purity, religious purity, and what it would be, what things could cause you to be made impure and prevent you from being able to, uh, say, uh, offer a sacrifice or enter the temple. So we think of purity as a, a, a boundary that sets us apart from the world. And so here is where Paul's fashion advice becomes significant. All of Paul's talk about clothing is about the moral life of Christians, the ethical life of the Christian community, the way that we behave, the way that we act toward each other and in the world. This new morality is set in terms of Clothing. Paul tells the Colossians to be clothed with their new self. The old self has died. Be clothed with the new self. Be clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Above all, love. 
And I think that Paul uses the metaphor of clothing because what is clothing for if not for going out in public, for going out into the world, for being in and among other people, maybe to be protected from the, the elements of the world. Clothing is for going out, perhaps preparing for a journey. Clothe yourselves with the new self. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Clothe yourselves with love. The Christian poet Wendell Berry uh, once wrote a poem that he titled, The Mad Farmer Flying the Flag of Rough Branch Secedes from the Union. And this is the poem. From the union of power and money, from the union of power and secrecy, from the union of government and science, from the union of government and art, from the union of science and money, from the union of ambition and ignorance, from the union of genius and war, from the union of outer space and inner vacuity, the mad farmer walks quietly away. From the union of self-gratification and self-annihilation, secede into care of one another and for the good gifts of heaven and earth. I'll repeat that ending. From the union of self-gratification and self-annihilation, secede into care for one another and for the good gifts of heaven and earth. I think he describes the power of an empire better than, uh, better than scripture itself. The union of all of these things. And he says, from that union, secede into care for one another and for the good gifts of heaven and earth. Christians are not called away from the empire. Paul is not spelling out these evils and dangers of the outside world in order to scare the church or in order to keep them cloistered within their community, but instead to lead them out into the world. Christians are not called away from the world. Purity in the church, purity in our life together is not moral perfection. But purity means refusing to use the empire's roadmaps refusing to buy into the empire's worldview. It is an unwillingness to live out the narrative of the empire in our shared life. This is something that I think we can learn from our Amish and Mennonite brothers and sisters. They have tended to live in cloistered, secluded communities, but in those communities they have had a fierce consistency, a fierce commitment to a particular kind of community, a community that gives witness, that gives life to the values that Christ taught, the values of God's kingdom and not the values of the world around where they have missed it, is in that call to take those values then and go out into the world. Purity for the church, purity in our life together is a consistent focus on the things that are above. It is a steadfast, faithful commitment as a community to living out the kingdom of God, letting the kingdom of God be seen in our living together and in our living out in the world. It is seceding from the union of self-gratification and self-annihilation in order to be more fully alive in the world, caring for one another, receiving the good gifts, of our Creator with thankful hearts, wearing the clothing of the kingdom of God. Let us pray. God, we pray that you would clothe us with the gifts of your Spirit, that you would clothe us with love, that when people meet us on the street, they would see your love. That when people see our community, the way that we treat one another, that they would see your love. May we together as a community bear witness to your kingdom. In Jesus' name.
Amen.